Hey guys, it's Jen from Ezekiel Effect Ministries. Shalom, shalom. Happy Tuesday. It's been a couple days since I've been on here reading the Psalms, and today I wanted to get back to that. We are on Psalm 39, and we're going to have a little bit of intertwining here today because there is just a little bit of backstory that I want to give to you before we actually read the Psalm. Um, this Psalm was actually written after David was cursed by a man named, I think it's Shemai, S-H-I-M-E-I, -E I'm not sure how you say it, but if you go back to 2 Samuel 16, starting in verse 5, basically this whole story, I'm going to read it to you, this whole story is about this man named Shemai, and he curses David, and then Psalm 39 is basically how David responds. So that's why I'm going to give you the context here. So it says, Now when King David came to Bahurim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemai, the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. Wow, so right out of the gate, this guy's cursing the king. He's throwing stones at him. I wonder if David had, King David had bodyguards at that point. It says, And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. So maybe that's what that means. Verse 7, Also Shammai said, Thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned, and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. So some pretty harsh words by this guy named Shammai. Verse 9, Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? So he's defending him. Please let me go over and take off his head. <laughs> so he's like the he's like the bodyguard. He's he's getting zealous here. But the king said, "What have I to do with you, you sons of Zerai? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David." Let me read that again. This is verse ten. So the king said, "What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeru?" Zer Z-E-R-U-I-A-H, Zerai, I'm not sure how to say it. So let him curse because the Lord has said to him, curse David. Who, to, who then shall say, why have you done so? So I think what he's implying is that the Lord is allowing this man, Shammai, to curse the king. The Lord has allowed it because obviously everything filters through God's hands. So if this man wanted to curse David and God allowed it, he's saying then the Lord allowed it. The, door, the Lord said, okay. And then we should say, why have you done so? And David said to Abshai and all his servants, see how my son who came from my own body seeks my life. How much more may now may this Benjamite let him alone and let him curse for the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. So what faith King David has in this moment he knows that the Lord is going to repay him, even though this man is cursing him. And then at verse 13, it says, And as David and his men went along the road, Shammai went along the hillside opposite him and cursed him as he went. So he still kept cursing him. He threw stones at him and he kicked up dust. <laughs> so this man is having a little temper tantrum, just throwing stuff at David. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Okay, so wow, what a story. <laughs> David is having faith in God that he is going to avenge him and that God allowed this for a reason to see how David perhaps was going to respond. So already you can tell David is not one of those people who's like, ooh, let's, get, let's retaliate right away. He's, he's waiting on the Lord. So now let's enter into Psalm 39, where it says, Prayer for wisdom and forgiveness. So I think all of us can glean from this today. 
<laughs> we all can relate. We've had a Shammai in our life who's cursed us, who's thrown stones at us, who's kicked dust at us, and we've all wanted to retaliate on some level. And yet, here's the wisdom, right, that the Lord is about to give us as to how we might handle these situations. Verse one, I said, I will guard, now this is King David talking. I will guard my ways, lest I sin, lest I sin with my tongue. I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. So he doesn't want to speak and lash out. He says, I will restrain my mouth with a, with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. That is such wisdom. I was mute with silence. I even held my peace I'm sorry, I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. So he's just burning. Like he wants to say something, but he's not. He's holding his tongue. So he's using the fruit of the Spirit, self control. And he's not saying anything. Now I'm going to go to the Passion Translation really quick here, which the title is A Cry for Help. Very appropriate. It says, here's my life motto, the truth I live by. I will guard my ways for all my days. I will speak only what is right, guarding what I speak. So again, that tongue being the most powerful and most dangerous weapon we have. He's guarding his mouth. Like watchman guards against the attack of the enemy, I'll guard and muzzle my mouth when the wicked are around me. I will remain silent and I will not grumble or speak out of my disappointment. But the longer I'm silent, the more my pain grows worse. My heart burned with a fire within me and my thoughts eventually boiled over until they finally came rolling out of my mouth. All right, so he's saying the same thing. Basically, it's like a fire. It's stoked. It's burning. It's building up. It's building up. So finally... He speaks, but guess who he speaks to? He speaks to the Lord. He doesn't lash out at his enemy. He talks to the Lord and he says, Lord, make me know my end. And what is the treasure? What is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths and my age is as nothing before you. And certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. Selah. So let's go to the Passion Translation here. He says, Lord, help me to know how fleeting on my time on earth is. Help me to know how limited is my life, that I'm only here but for a moment more. What a brief time you've given me to live. Compared to you, my lifetime is nothing at all. Nothing more than a puff of air. I'm gone so swiftly. So too are the grandest of men. They are nothing but a fleeting shadow. And there's that pause again. So he's just reflecting on how quickly his life is going and just poof, at any moment, he's so fragile that it could just become a vapor, right? He says, we live our lives like those living in shadows. All our activities and energies are spent for things that pass away. So he's really saying like, what's, what matters here? What matters? The things that he's doing, it's just going to pass away. It's not going into eternity with him. We gather, we hoard, we cling to our things only to leave them behind for who knows who. Yeah, so it's really just like we get so caught up in these earthly things, but eventually we're going to leave them behind. So he's really recognizing just the, the I don't know what, what I want to say, just he's recognizing it's not worth it to get all wrapped up in these kinds of earthly things. Verse 7, And now, God, I'm left with one conclusion. My only hope is to hope in you alone. Save me from being overpowered by my sin. Don't make me a disgrace before the, de de the degenerate. Lord, I'm left speechless and I have no excuse, so I'll not complain any longer. So he's switching over to praising God, basically, in saying, or he's asking God to basically save him from his sin. But in a sense, he's, he's praising God because he's saying, like, God is the one he's crying out to because God's the only one that matters. Like, when he leaves the earth, nothing is going to matter. And so he's, that's why he's turning his attention to God. He has no excuse. He has nothing to say. He doesn't have any way of complaining or responding here. 
he says, now I know you're the one who's behind it all. He knows that the Lord allowed this man to basically disgrace him and shame him and mock him and kick dust and throw stones at him. He says, but I can't take it much longer. Spare me these blows from your discipline rod, for if you are against me, I will waste away to nothing. No one endures when you rebuke and discipline us for our sins. Like a cobweb is swept away from a wave of the hand, you sweep away all that we once called dear. How fleeting and frail our lives were nothing more than a puff of air. So he goes back to that, how life is not much more than a puff of air. And then the last section here, it says, Lord, listen to all my tender cries. Read my every tear like liquid words that, that plead for your help. I feel all alone at times like a stranger to you, passing through this life just like those before me. So it's like David is saying, you know, he just feels really alone in this moment. And he's crying out to the Lord to just hear his uh, distress, to see the tears that he's shedding. It's really difficult for him to endure, endure this torment. He says, don't let me die without restoring joy and gladness to my soul. May your frown over my failure become a smile over my success. So I'm, I'm interpreting that he's alluding to his failure and part of the reason why that guy Shammai was um, basically rebuking him was because of his sins with Bathsheba. With Bathsheba. Um, and so there's still consequences because of his actions that are having that ripple effect. And so it sounds like he's being slandered for the things that he he's done. And he's just clamoring for the Lord to have mercy on him, basically, and to re restore the joy and the gladness to his soul because he's just feeling really attacked and um, really down on himself, feeling really alone. So that's the end of Psalm 39. And what we want to focus on here is the similarities in terms of how David is handling his enemy and his response to it. Um, there's a couple more verses I want to read to you. One is Isaiah 53, 7. And this is basically saying how Jesus, it's comparing David's response to how Jesus would have responded, how Jesus has responded to persecution and slandering. It's Isaiah 53, 7. And it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. I'm, I'm actually going to... Um, start a little bit earlier. I love Psalm 53. I love Psalm 53. Um, so I'm actually going to read a good portion of it through Psalm, through verse 7 because um, it just points to the cross. You know, it just points to what Jesus did for us, the sacrifice that he made. Um, and yeah, it's just a powerful, powerful verse. Isaiah 53, who has believed our rapport? I report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So the Lord is saying there's no real reason why we'd be, why we'd be attracted or to want to follow Jesus. Um, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As we hid, as if it were our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. So he was being despised by people, and we hid our faces because we didn't want to watch. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, spitten, smitten by God, and afflicted. Just like, just like how David was. The Lord allowed him to suffer. The Lord allowed Jesus to suffer. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. So what a powerful verse. That is such a powerful healing verse. When we think about what Jesus did, the sacrifice that he gave for us, for our sins, he was chastised. He was bruised for our, inequ our inequities. He was wounded for our transgressions. He took a punishment that he didn't deserve. He never sinned. And yet we esteemed him not. It says, And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his way. 
and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the inequity of his, of us all. So we have sinned and not followed the Lord, and yet he gave us his son. And so it reminds me of that verse from Romans that talks about while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, it didn't matter that we didn't care about God or Jesus. God still died for us. He still sent his son. Okay, and then verse 7, which is the one I was telling you about how it parallels how David responded. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. So David didn't slander anybody back. Jesus didn't lash back at anyone. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. That just, that just makes me want to weep when I just think about the silence, um, just the silence that Jesus had, the silence that David had, that is the ultimate trust and faith and act of humility that we could possibly do. That's literally like bowing down before your enemies. That's like washing their feet quietly, silently saying, I will say nothing. I will humble myself. I will wait on the Lord. I will trust the Lord whatever the Lord wants to do, but he was not going to lash back. It was not his place. He knew that the Lord allowed it, and it was not his place to do or say anything. So the next one I wanted to read was Matthew 26, 63. And this actually comes from a chapter where it's talking about how Jesus is facing the Sanhedrin. And they, I'll just give you a little context. Um, they took Jesus to Caiaphas, the high priest. And basically like the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter was sort of like in the background there. And the priests and the elders were having this council. They were basically talking about how Jesus was giving false testimony. They wanted to put him to death, but they couldn't find anything wrong. They couldn't find any way to condemn him. And it says, but at last two false witnesses came forward and they said, this fellow, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. That's what Jesus said. And the, the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify about against you? And then this is verse 63 that I was telling you about. It says, but Jesus kept silent. So here they are, again, slandering him, just like David, condemning him, probably kicking dust on him, probably throwing stones at him in a sense, but Jesus kept silent. All the accusations were against him, but Jesus kept silent. And it said, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you were the Christ, the son of God. And then finally in verse 64, he says to them, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then again, they say to him in verse 65, the high priest, he tore Jesus's clothes and he said, he has spoken blasphemy. So there he goes again. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And then they answered, he is deserving of death. They spat in his face and they beat him. And the other ones struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So what, what an what a response here by Jesus. He absolutely said nothing. He kept silent. And then he basically reiterated back to them what, what they wanted to hear. And in his silence, it irritated them. And they accused him again of blasphemy. They spat at him. They basically struck him and they said, you know, put him, put him to death. So that was kind of the end. Um, before he ended up getting sent to Pilate. That was the last um, trial, if you will. So I think we can take a lot from this and it's very deep, obviously, but just the nutshell of it is that when we are serving the Lord, when we are 
walking with Jesus, we can expect persecution. When we are upholding the law of love, when we're loving people like Jesus loved people, they may not be able to love us back. In fact, they may hate us because we're, we're honoring Jesus and we're doing what Jesus would do. And we're not retaliating. We're not responding the way a typical person would be expected to in the world. We're responding in a fashion that is so much greater, you know, and our silence often speaks volumes. So I just want to encourage you that when you're facing persecution, because you will, just know that there are options. Just know that there are options and the options are to cling to Jesus. It's not hopeless. Jesus is always with you. And if Jesus could do it and he had no sin and he was falsely accused, he understands how you might be feeling if you've been falsely accused. And if you even, you know, even if you've done something and it's because of your sin and people retaliate, you can still repent. You can still ask the Lord for forgiveness today. You can make it right with the Lord. Um, but those people don't have a right to condemn you in the eyes of the Lord. He will, um, if you repent, you know, the Lord sees you as cleansed and forgiven. But their retaliation is actually committing more sin. So it doesn't warrant more more retaliation, no matter if you're, you know, asking for forgiveness or not, it just doesn't, you know, it's just not the right response. Um, and so you might be boiling, you know, you might be feeling like David, you might be just in your humanness feeling like, I, I don't get why they're acting like this. This is not justified. This is so unfair. Maybe it just feels really, really unfair. So you can take heart and we can know that Jesus and David understand Jesus certainly understands how you feel, and David was able to put his trust and faith in the Lord, so we can do that too. So um, I just want to say a little prayer for strength today. Um, Father God, I just thank you for my friends who are watching this video today, and Lord, I thank you that you have given them the fruit of the Spirit. If they are followers of you, we thank you that you have given them the ability to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, we thank you that you will avenge us of our enemies. We thank you, Lord, that we can remain silent the way Jesus and David did. We thank you, Lord, that there is such great modeling that we have seen and witnessed. And when push comes to shove, we know that the way to win souls is not through violence, but actually through submission and trusting in you, Lord. We know that you're the one who does the judging and you're the one who does the vindicating. And we thank you that that's not our job and we can remain silent when necessary. So we thank you, Lord, that um, we can be peacemakers. And I just bless my friends today. I pray that um, they would stay under Psalm 91 protection. And I just thank you that you go before us with your angel armies and you will make a way out of any situation even when it seems hopeless. And I pray that anyone who doesn't know you today, Lord, they would put their trust in you as their Lord and Savior, that they would repent and turn from their sins and that they would trust their life to you today, that they would say yes, and today would be the day that they would start a new life. And we thank you, Lord, that you're building spiritual muscle Silence is very difficult, but it's powerful. It sends a message, and we thank you for giving us that perseverance and that tenacity to do like Jesus and David did. So we give you the glory today, Lord, for your strength that's within us. In Jesus' mighty name. So I just wanted to thank you for being here. I thank all my new subscribers, and I just wanted to let you know I do have a new merch store. If you want to check the um, link, I'll put it in the in the description section. You can go to my website. And there's some cool merch there. If you have any ideas of things that you want me to create, also drop me a comment in the comment session, section. And um, please like and subscribe and uh, share with your friends and family if you so desire. So I hope you have a wonderful, blessed day. And until next time, shalom, shalom.